Thank you, Alex. Um, so let's. Uh, we're gonna take. Uh, we got about 15 minutes. Maybe we'll, we'll be able to squeeze on a couple extra minutes for some questions and answers. So. For those of you who are interested, um, let me take moderator privilege and, and pose the first question, something that I'd like to uh, pose to all three panelists, and that is, since we've had a reoccurring thing uh, with regard to young people and youth and, and, of course, the issue of parents, what do we say to those parents, myself included, who at times cross this question and say, hmm, I don't know, I mean, I still have insecurity, you know? What do we say to parents? who don't have that political, social consciousness about decriminalization and legalization uh, with regard to the question of legalization? Well, I mean, I think it's important for parents to have open, open, honest conversations with their kids. I mean, you know, lying and scare tactics have never worked. I mean, ever, ever, ever on anything. Um, so you know, we actually have a publication called Safety First, and we have it out on our table in both English and Spanish. And it is a guide for parents to have these conversations with their kids, uh, to talk about marijuana in a health context rather than in a do it or don't do it kind of uh, moralistic context. Uh, because what we really want is for young people to have the information they need to make good decisions. And so, you know, when you tell someone don't do it, you know, that immediately conjures up a bunch of things. But when you tell somebody to delay behavior um, because it is, you know, much less harmful the longer you wait, it's not just drugs that we talk about in this context, it's sexual activity as well. Um, you know, that's a message that I think is more salient with, with young people rather than just this is a prohibited thing that you're never allowed to do. Oh, and it's so fun as you see everyone talk about how wonderful it is. Um, so I think that that is a good place to start. Um, and then also not discounting any questions that kids have as being not old enough to have that conversation because they are hearing this and they're seeing it on TV and their friends are talking about it. So even if you have someone that's 10, 11 years old and is asking about marijuana, and the immediate thought is, well, you're too young to think about that, they're not. And they're never too young to think about what makes a good decision and what makes a healthy person. I don't have any kids, but that's just what I would say. If I just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's all. That's all. Um, that's perfect. <laughs> Opening the dialogue, uh, demystifying uh, all drugs, including... Um, I mean, it's, I think a similar tactic to uh, best practices as far as talking about alcohol, again, demystifying it. Um, people can observe their parents and other adults drinking. Um, but when, when pot's legal, they can see their uh, parents and other adults smoking pot. And so I think it's important to have that open dialogue. I also don't have children. Um, but but I've, I've talked with, with friends' children about, about these issues. And, um, you know, I, I think that yeah, having this air of mystery, this this idea that that responsible adults can can party, but it but youth should be totally absent and just it, it doesn't work. You end up with kids doing shots in their bedroom before going out because they don't want to do it in front of their parents. And um, oh. <laughs> I don't think yeah. No, no, actually, I, I, that's what. And I think they are answering the question to some degree. I mean, but go ahead, continue. Well, and yeah, I guess more to that, I would um, add that the consequences of, of going to jail for possession, would you rather your child go to jail or try smoking marijuana or smoke marijuana occasionally versus go to jail? And I think, I mean, that's up to, to the parent. Alex, do you want to? I mean, what would, what would you say? I guess, I mean, I have no kids. Um, I have lots of friends who have kids and um, lots of babies in my life. Um, but I think that to the parents, I would, I mean, growing up, my father never told me that anything was bad. He would just, like, point out that there's, there's a negative way of using things that, you know, like, moderation and moderation, everything in moderation as well. Um, so I think that when talking to parents about why it's important um, to stop prohibition and you know just to help make them feel safer about marijuana and cannabis becoming legal, legalized and decriminalized is that I mean it's not it's not really going to affect them the way that they think it is and so really just saying that question what you've been told that makes you not want it to be legal. Um, because a lot of the propaganda that's put out there 
is based on research that the government did a really long time ago that is just all nonsense. And so just like asking them to do their research or presenting something to them that challenges what they've been told before and really asking them to open their minds to something else um, and like, you know, to question the system that we already have in place. That's what I would say to them. So a question up here in front, man. So I actually have two questions for two different panelists that you that made us wait to the end. So I was, the first one was to Amanda. And she gave the example about them sending the 50 children out to what would happen do you think if you send 50 kids in the east and west office to buy alcohol under the age of 21? Do you think any of them would be able to get it? Oh, because absolutely. I think that so, so what I'm trying my whole point is this is that I understand that um, right now the way it's decriminalized, but I still think that legalizing it will always have a, a bigger negative effect on communities who are impoverished than anybody else. It's just like with liquor and other things that have been legalized. So I think the equivalent would have been, could they get something that is currently legal that they're not supposed to be able to get um, under the circumstances that it is legal? Um, the other question is, everybody keeps using the term occasional user. But how do we make sure that these folks stay occasional users? Um, and the last one was for Lizzie. You said that it was legal for children under 21 to, to drink in the home. I've been told that I could be held legally responsible for a child under age drinking. So I didn't quite understand where that was coming from. Okay, so I think the first question is a really good one because that's about regulation. Because you can say that marijuana is not accessible um, for anybody under 21 and that you have to show ID to get into a store, but then you still have to have the owner of the store IDing the person. And you know, that is not enforced equally uh, when you look at how you know, alcohol is enforced in different communities. In some communities, there's no way you can, are going to be able to buy alcohol unless you show ID. And then in others, it's a lot looser. And so people that are looking to buy alcohol that are underage know the, the ones you go. I mean, I knew that when I was in high school, the one bar that you would go to where you wouldn't get carded. And all the underage people went there because it was the only bar you could get into where you weren't carded. So that still exists. The question becomes, is it better to address this in a criminal way where the people involved are going to jail and getting records and having the, the outcomes associated with criminality, or is it better to handle it in a civil and educational way where we have licensing and people that are selling to minors, you know, they are getting their licenses revoked, and then along with that, we're doing really good education for young people about why they want to delay their marijuana use. Now, it's not a perfect system, but I think the thing we have to keep asking ourselves is, is it better than what we've got now? And, and when we look at the choice being sending a kid to jail or giving them probation or having their lives be disrupted that way versus having to do a really good job that we educate them about why young people should wait to use marijuana, you know, we have to think what is more likely to be detrimental to them 5, 10, 15 years down the road. And from research, what we're seeing is that it's definitely the criminal record that stands to be more detrimental to them 5, 10, 15 years down the road. And then just to answer your other question about how do we keep people as occasional users, I mean, that's who what most people are. I think we have to understand that most people that use marijuana are using it occasionally. Um, you know, there's a small percentage of people that use regularly. Most people that try marijuana will never even go on to be occasional users. They'll be experimenters who do it once or twice at a party and decide it's not for them. So I think that we have to really understand that we don't want to regulate for the very, very small percentage of people. What we want to do is regulate for the average person. The average person that's using marijuana is an adult who's using it occasionally, who's usually using it in their own home. Um, and that's, you know, the system that we want to encourage. Um, and then along with that, you want to make sure that there's plenty of evidence-informed treatment and prevention programs, both for youth, but for also adults that feel like maybe they're using too much. But when you do this abstinence-only, just-say-no approach, there is absolutely no room for the person that wants to reduce their use. There's only the room for the person that's ready to say, I'm going to quit. And so I think it, it brings in that wiggle room that we just don't get under prohibition when we make it very legal and legal. Yeah, I agree with everything Amanda said. And the only thing I would add is that we know that criminal uh, sanctions do not deter use. They do not prevent people from going, the, those few who would become, um, develop a dependency to marijuana. Criminal sanctions do not um, have an impact on the likelihood of doing that. 
Um, but yeah, we certainly need to look at <coughs> regulation um, with, I mean, uh, prescription drug use is becoming a very uh, big problem and that is a legal regulated drug and now heroin is making a comeback because oxycontin is getting too expensive. And so there's, so, so yeah, I think this emphasis on treatment and education is going to be, um, or is much more important than, and will have a greater impact than criminal um, convictions. Um, as for the alcohol rules, uh, laws, my understanding is that uh, consumption in the private residence is not uh, prohibited. If that minor were to leave the house intoxicated, um, then, then that's public intoxication and that's a, that's a misdemeanor. Um, if, the, if, the, if the minor were to consume alcohol in public, that's also against the law. But in the home, um, in, a, in a private residence, then it's not illegal. Okay. So let's see if we can power through some of these guys. If we can keep it to one question. We have one back here in the, in the back, sir. So what's the question? So, so if just so I can get it. So, uh, what of the role of the Drug Enforcement Administration and the fear that uh, it causes a lot of other medical problems? Um, okay, so the, so the role of the feds in this. Um, so, they have come out and said that they are going to allow states to decide their own marijuana policies as long as they kind of follow these eight guidelines, right? Including not diverting out of state, no selling to minors, no cartel involvement. Now, in California, we've had a very different situation. Because even before states legalized and went that route, um, we have had interference from the federal government around our medical marijuana program because we don't have any clear state-level guidelines and the feds have taken advantage of that. It's left us vulnerable. And so they've come in and caused a whole lot of problems. Um, so it's not necessarily to say that this will fix it all. I mean, honestly, I think we need Melinda Haig to retire before we get our problems fixed in that area. Um, but I think that, you know, we have seen the federal government take a stance of hands off as long as this is done responsibly. Um, now, when the federal government will change their policy on marijuana, you know, who knows? But it took a myriad of states to stop following alcohol prohibition before the federal government stood up and took notice and did anything for that either. Um, so I think it is going to be a state-by-state -state thing, and the best we can do is to develop an airtight uh, regulatory regime where we don't find ourselves vulnerable to the DEA. And then just real quickly about the, um, I feel like I can't see half the room. Um, just real quickly about the claims. You know, it's really interesting is whenever we sit down with opponents of, of, of uh, marijuana legalization, they immediately say, we can't legalize because what about the kids? And marijuana causes this harm or that harm. Let me just say this really clearly. Nobody who supports marijuana legalization thinks that young children should have access to marijuana except under the very specific care of a physician. And so really the argument that we shouldn't legalize marijuana because it's harmful isn't logical. Because what we're saying is that controlling marijuana through a legalization regime is actually much better at reducing the harms associated with marijuana use because it helps educate people, it makes sure that marijuana is tested, it makes sure that youth aren't getting access to it. So I think that you know any substance poses potential harm. The question is how do you devise a policy regime that minimizes that harm to the extent possible while still allowing for, uh, for autonomy of the, of the individual. And so I think that's what we're trying to get at because we don't think that marijuana is harmless. Uh, but we think that regulation is a better approach than prohibition, given the context of potential harm. Wonderful. We have a few more minutes. Um, David, right here in the front table. Yeah, I mean, regular use is usually considered um, almost daily. Uh, occasional use is considered once or more in the last six months. Um, experimental use means once or twice. And this is the, the, what the federal government kind of uses with their national survey on drug use and health to determine. It's really wide, and, and, and it just, so just to kind of give you all an idea, the federal government's National Survey on Drug Use and Health is kind of the most comprehensive household-based research survey that they do about drug use. It's what they use to determine 
whether people are using more drugs or less drugs or what drugs are using in the United States. The only question they ask about marijuana is have you ever used it? <laughs> have you used it in the past six months? And have you used it in the past week? And so, and it doesn't ask, I mean, as we know, when you ask someone, hey, how many joints do you smoke in a day? There's like a joint, and then there's like a joint, <laughs> right? We also know that marijuana has unique behavioral properties in the fact that most people share their marijuana while they're using it. Whereas, you know, with a glass of wine, it's not like I take a sip and then pass it down to the person next to me. So just to say that all of these really unique things about the way marijuana is consumed has made it not fit into the context with which we study other substances, and it really demands its own unique pathway. Um, the good news is that you know, with revenue generation from legal cannabis, you know, Colorado already gave away about $9 million in research grants, and so there's the opportunity to do what the federal government has dropped the ball on for the past 40 years, which is to actually put some money and some oomph into a marijuana research program in the United States. So I'm hopeful that we will just be able to start generating more and more data uh, on that in the future. So we got a, uh, we got a bunch of hands. I, I don't know that we have, we'll be able to get to everybody, but sir, uh, I'm gonna go to you before we start uh, wrapping it up. One thing is uh, coming back. So is there still a bad market? Can we only do part of the hog and can we wrap it up? Um, okay, so, <laughs> all right, so I know you all are probably hungry and we've got amazing food out um, uh, by Thunder Road Catering today. Um, for you all, but I just wanted to address those things. So, so your first question about the illicit market, that I'm gonna file that under reasons why I'm really glad California didn't go first. Legalization, <laughs> because it's just, it's just difficult, right? Um, you know, it's figuring out price elasticity, you know, it's, it's how much are people willing to pay where it's gonna reduce the illicit market as much as possible. You know, what's the right tax sweet spot so that it really brings people out of the shadows and in the legitimate market. And we have economists that are working on this issue right now, that are analyzing what's going on in Colorado and Washington, that are looking at ways to improve upon it, and that we will need to continue to improve upon it. I mean, California passed medical marijuana 18 years ago. We've been joined by 23 states plus D.C., and everyone's still trying to figure out what's the best model and what's the best way to go. Um, so I think that that is something that's going to come. But again, do we want to wait and have people go to jail and have you know their lives ruined in the meantime or trying to come, kind of come up with that sweet spot i think is something important to ask and then the other question was the about, other question is whether or not one day i'll be able to do some good cocaine without being thrown ah, so, <laughs> um, so you know it's a that's a really interesting question and i think when we look at the context of prohibition right we looked at our different models up here and those models apply to any drug so when we talk about any drug where you're going to have the most control over who sells it, who makes it, where it's being sold, is going to be regulation versus prohibition. I mean, that just goes without saying. The question is, are we ready to elevate other substance use into a legitimate market and have all of the fail-safes we need to ensure that people that engage in that use have the right resources and services available to them should they need education, should they need overdose prevention, you know, should they need treatment. And so it's a great way to start the conversation because honestly, when you look at illicit substance use in this country, outside of marijuana use, it's a relatively <laughs> small phenomenon that does not happen very often. So I think, you know, once we remove marijuana kind of from this war on drugs and look what's left, it will seem much more manageable um, in terms of getting people treatment and, and, the, and the resources that they need. Um, so I will say it's a great place to start the conversation about what it means to regulate rather than prohibit substance.